Sir Richard Francis Burton. Sir Richard Francis Burton was born in Torquay, a seaside town in the UK, on March the 19th, 1821. His father was Captain Joseph Netteville Burton, a British Army officer of Irish descent, and his mother, an heiress of a wealthy family in Hertfordshire. The family travelled a lot during his childhood. From a young age, he had a knack for learning languages, and he learned French, Italian and Latin in no time at all. He started in the Trinity College of Oxford, but he wasn't that good a student, and instead he allotted his time to studying languages. He learned Arabic, and he also tried his hand at falconry and fencing. He left Oxford and enlisted in the East India Company Army. He would have participated in the First Afghan War, but the conflict was over even before he got to India. Despite this, he was assigned to the Bombay Native Infantry. During his stay in India, he became a fluent speaker of Hindi, Gujarati and Marathi, as well as Persian and Arabic. Such was his fondness for languages, he even kept tame monkeys at this time with the hope of getting a grasp of their language. Burton's interest and active participation in the cultures and religions of India was scrutinised by some of his military comrades, who accused him of going native and branded him the white nigger. He was appointed to take part in mapping the Sith, where he learned how to get around measuring gear, knowledge that would really come in handy later in his career as an explorer. In that time he started travelling wearing different clothes and he renamed himself Mirza Abdullah. His disguise was so brilliantly good that even his colleagues thought he were a native. In 1849 he returned to Europe on sick leave where he ventured out to Bologna where whilst passing by a fencing school he first met the woman who would later become his wife, Isabel Arundel, a young Catholic woman from a well-off family. Spurred on by his thirst for adventure, Burton got the approval of the Royal Geographical Society to make a pilgrimage to the heart of Arabia, to the holy cities of Mecca and Medina. Although he certainly weren't the first non-Muslim European to make the journey to Mecca, his journey was the most documented of his time, and from it he found a bit of fame. His seven years in India on army service helped him get used to the customs and behaviour of Muslims. And he laboured on the preparation, spending a month in Alexandria learning how to eat, drink and sleep, sit, and of course pray correctly. The proper way to walk into a mosque with the right foot first. According to Burton's accounts, most Muslims who ran into him thought he was definitely a Muslim, but not a good one like themselves, but still better than nothing. The fierce preparation was paramount because, as a European, he was risking his life taking this pilgrimage. If people realised he wasn't Muslim, if they realised he was an imposter, he would be put to death. But the trek to Mecca was dangerous. He was robbed by bandits on the way, and it wasn't without mistakes either. One evening in Cairo, Burton, disguised as an Indian doctor, exchanged a few drinks with an Albanian soldier he'd just met. But the drinks got a bit out of hand, and the Albanian caused a fracas. Burton had, despite his lengthy preparation, unknowingly drunk something forbidden to practising Muslims. Burton left Cairo hurriedly as words started to get around. He would continue to drink on his pilgrimage though, but only in the utmost secrecy. He finally set foot in Medina, the real location of the Prophet Muhammad's tomb, despite many Europeans at that time believing that the Prophet's tomb was in Mecca. Muslim culture was not well known in the Victorian era of Burton's day. This trip made Burton a Zair, a pilgrim who had visited Medina, and despite thinking his trip to Medina didn't live up to expectations, his trip afterwards to Mecca didn't disappoint him, and he did the pilgrimage following all the correct steps, distracted occasionally in proper Burton style by an exotic young beauty. After travelling to Mecca as a pilgrim, Burton finally became a haji, which allowed him to wear the green turban. 
One story tells that he was almost caught as in full disguise he went to have a pee. And rather than squatting as an Arab would, he lifted up his robe. Apparently he was caught doing this and to avoid being exposed and ultimately killed, he himself killed the boy who had caught him. He denied it until his death. In fact, he became so tired of denying it that he started having a laugh about it. When he was asked by a doctor how he felt having killed a man, Burton's reply was, Quite jolly, what about you? His reply to a priest when asked the same question was, Sir, I am proud to say I have committed every sin in the Decalogue. After completing the pilgrimage, he returned to Cairo, and stopping off in India, he then travelled to the port city of Aden in Yemen, in, in order to prepare for another expedition to explore the interior of Somalia. Burton hoped to find the large lakes he had heard about from the Arab travellers. While he was in Aden, he met Lieutenant John Annin Speak, who would later accompany him on his most famous expedition. While in Somalia, camped near Berbera with Speak and another two lieutenants, Hearn and Stroyan, they were attacked by 200 Somali warriors. In the fight, Stroyan was killed, Speak was captured and wounded in 11 distinct places before he could escape. Burton was regarded as a demonic fighter in the army and fought valiantly but was impaled with a javelin, the point of it entering one cheek and exiting the other side of his mouth. He ran away with the javelin still transfixed in his head. The attack left him with a huge scar on his face. Not surprisingly, he later wrote that the Somali were a fierce and turbulent race. The exploration to the lakes Tanganyika and Victoria took place a year later, in which he left Somalia and joined the army again with hopes of fighting in Crimea. Prior to leaving for Zanzibar, Burton secretly got engaged to Isabel Arundel. Her mother wouldn't allow a marriage due to Burton's lack of Catholicism and wealth. Burton had heard stories about the inland sea and he even hoped that the expedition would reveal the source of the River Nile. Speak again accompanied him on his quest and they headed west in search of the lakes. They formed a strong bond during the lengthy journey and both men had problems with tropical diseases. Speak went blind for a big chunk of the journey and went deaf in one ear caused by an infection after trying to remove a beetle. Burton wasn't able to walk and he had to be carried for a part of the journey. They arrived at Lake Tanganyika in February 1858. Burton was astounded by the sight of the magnificent lake. Speak, unfortunately, after such a long trek, was unable to see the lake due to his blindness. On their return journey, Burton got ill, and Speak continued alone, trekking north until he stumbled upon Lake Victoria. Speak believed he had finally found the source of the Nile. Both Speak and Burton returned home very ill. As usual, Burton kept meticulous notes on the geography, language, customs, and even sexual habits of the people he encountered. Those notes would later be very useful to explorers going into East Africa. A long dispute between the two men followed the expedition. There were problems with the unpaid debts brought on by the expedition in Africa. Speak believed Burton had responsibility for the debt. As Burton arrived to London, he found that Speak had already given a lecture to the Royal Geographical Society, proclaiming his discovery that Lake Victoria was indeed the source of the Nile. Burton was not pleased, firstly because he didn't agree with Speak's theory, and secondly because apparently they had agreed to give the first speech on what they had found in East Africa together. In England, Speak was being lionised for his role, and Burton felt his own role were being portrayed as secondary to Speak's as the long, drawn-out dispute damaged the reputations of both men. And on the 16th of September 1864, both men were scheduled to debate the source of the Nile at a meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science. The day before the debate, Burton and Speak sat near each other in the lecture hall. Speak stood up and left abruptly, saying, I can't stand this anymore. That same afternoon he went hunting and was found dead. 
near a wall with a wound in his side. There were no eyewitnesses, and theories of suspicion and even suicide spread. In addition to his thirst for travelling and languages, Burton had a huge interest in sex and sexuality, until the point that, during his travels, he would actually make measurements of the lengths of the sexual organs of male inhabitants where he travelled. I did mention before that his notes were meticulous. He also described sexual techniques common in the differing regions, occasionally hinting that he had actually participated, hence breaking the sexual and racial taboo of the Victorian era. He also helped translate the Kama Sutra. His translation became the most widely known English translation. Furthermore, he translated the erotic Arabic guide, The Perfumed Garden. Arabian Nights, also known as the Book of the Thousand Nights and a Night, out of English, was also translated by Burton. Sir Richard Francis Burton died in Italy of a heart attack in 1890 after starting a diplomatic career which took him to Damascus, Santos and Fernando Po, travelling from birth till death, learning a total of 25 languages. Richard Burton, explorer extraordinaire.